Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Bharat Anand, and I'm a partner in Ketan's M&A practice. Um, and on behalf of the firm, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you uh, to this webinar, um, essentially uh, looking at uh, public M&A in India and what's market in the public M&A space. Uh, this is the third webinar of our M&A Master Series 2022, and we look forward to your company throughout uh, this, the, the, the program. Uh, we've been thrilled with the tremendous response that we've received from all of you and literally had thousands of registrations uh, uh, and, and a large part of uh, choreographing the topics uh, and the panelists and the expertise that they bring in has been based on your feedback. So for that, we're very grateful for your interest and support. Let's have a look at the agenda for the webinar today. Um, Mitesh, would you mind moving to the webinar agenda slide, please? Uh, so on this uh, slide, we have uh, we have the agenda uh, set out. In short, the format for today's uh, panel uh, is is going to be really a discussion uh, moderated by me, but between our expert panelists. Um, <clears throat> we will have questions directed at the panelists, but of course, if any of you uh, in the audience have a particular question, please feel free. Uh, to add it using the facility provided and we'll try and get to your question uh, please also note that after the end of the webinar you will receive an email setting out uh, the presentation that we have for you here today a summary of the notes uh, and a link to the webinar recording um, <clears throat> before i introduce the panel uh, let's reflect on the topic uh, that, that we have today which is what's happening in public m a in india what's really a uh, market in india and uh, 2022 uh, really in the public m a space has gone off uh, you know with a with, with a real bang you had uh, the pvr inox uh, business combination you had hdfc hdfc bank you had a controlling uh, stake transaction for just dial um, and then of course the big announcement by adani in terms of the whole sim cement business as well uh, at the global level, there have been some mega deals as well. We've all heard of Elon Musk's um, uh, acquisition and offer for Twitter. Um, and, and, and I think what's interesting is that, uh, uh, as, as in this panel, we will discuss key concepts and considerations that have to be kept in mind while doing public M&A deals. There's so much, you know, as the name suggests, in, in, in public, you know, being followed by, uh, by, by the stock market, by, by analysts, by proxy advisors. Uh, but the nuances of every transaction is different and of course uh, one needs very specific advice um, um, we we have uh, can i just request the next slide please so let, let me introduce the panel now uh, every person who's registered for this uh, has already received an email with full cvs of our panelists so i'm not going to spend a lot of time on their on their background suffice to say that we have uh, a panel with excellent M&A credentials. We have Saurav Malik, uh, Joint Managing Director at uh, Kotak Investment Banking. We have Rinki Ganguly, uh, Senior Vice President in Brookfield's Private Equity Group. And we have Pooja Sumani, CFO Middle East and Global Treasury Head at Cars24. Uh, joining them on the panel are my fellow uh, partners uh, from Khatan and Company. And we have Sudhir Basi, who's a, a executive director in our capital markets team and heads up that team, along with my corporate M&A partner, the very able Abhishek Dal. Both of them are very experienced public M&A lawyers. Uh, before we kick off and you know turn to the Q&A, to the panelists, I would just say, uh, please share your war stories. Uh, please feel free to chime in uh, once your fellow panelist has uh, provided his comments. Uh, please try and keep to the time limit of about three to four minutes for the questions which have been directed at you. Uh, and if I intervene, please forgive me. The idea is to do justice to the audience and to be able to cover the vast range of issues that really uh, this topic demands. Um, <clears throat> um, can we can we go to the panel format, please? Thank you. Okay, great. So uh, let's let's kick off. Um, and, and maybe uh, sort of, I'd like to start with you, and uh, maybe Pooja, you'd like to chime in as well, because the question is really on, uh, you know, what's driving public M&A activity, 
there's been a huge uh, surge, notwithstanding the fact that we had COVID. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's obviously been some interesting things that have been happening, you know, globally with central banks, etc. But uh, what, in your views, have been the key driver for public M&A activity in, in the recent uh, past? Thanks, Bharat. So, uh, just to set the context first, uh, in calendar 21, overall, we had about 150 billion of uh, M&A of which public m a was about 25 percent 38 billion in calendar 20 uh, out of a total uh, m a of 114 public m a was only 21 billion so from 21 billion of public m a that's gone up to 38 billion uh, close to about almost a hundred percent increase and in the current six months we are already seeing public m a at close to about 68 billion another doubling of that so that's indeed uh, remarkable in many ways. What's important to note is that what is really driving some of this? I think there's a multitude of factors. First is that uh, there is liquidity. Liquidity is available. That is driving m and in general, but it's also driving public m and The second important factor which is driving public m and is that particularly in turbulent times, uh, as we went through COVID over the last two years, there are two aspects to any kind of an MA. One is that there must be a willing buyer and a willing seller. Second, there must be a benchmark of a price. Now, in a typical private MA transaction, you are negotiating a value and a price at Vinicio, De Novo, from bottom to top. Whereas in a public MA, you have a public benchmark. It helps in many ways. You are then thereafter only negotiating what is a premium or a discount to a listed company price. In addition to that, financing becomes a lot more easy and available, particularly when you're dealing with uh, listed stocks, because again, there is a benchmark that is kind of out there. And last but not the least, a desire and intent of companies to really grow and use capital markets to uh, fuel uh, acquisitions and subsequently divestments, particularly for many of the financial sponsors. And starting with a listed company uh, becomes very, very helpful. And some of the examples like that are, you know, KKR Radiant's acquisition of Max, uh, whereby they acquired Max through a transaction which was created a listed company. And then over a period of time, KKR has sold down a material portion of their shareholding. Uh, again, the acquisition of uh, Crompton Reeves Consumer Electricals by Advent and Tamasic, an acquisition which created a listed company and then able to use the capital markets to really divest down. So I think these are some of the reasons, I would say, which are fueling public MA. Yeah, totally. Uh, sort of, I align. I, I completely agree. I think the liquidity in the market uh, proportionately you know, directly impacts the number of deals that we see in a MA sphere always. That have been the trend we have seen all through in multiple years. I think uh, the reason why that also happens uh, both in public MA and in MA in general is because uh, that liquidity creates a lot of pressure to grow and also therefore a need to seize the opportunity to, to disrupt in the as faced by the CEOs of these public companies in that environment. And I think that has definitely driven the unprecedented flurry of deals that we are seeing in the last 12 to 18 months. Thanks. Um, thanks, Aurel and Pooja. And I think, I, th I think you're right that the you know, unprecedented surge in liquidity and you know cash has really been key. We haven't seen a significant number of uh, combinations by using uh, you know the scheme route the good old scheme route um, and, and and it's interesting also to see what happens and how the markets respond to the fed's rate hikes and what that does to you know the private equity fueled uh, m a boom uh, to the extent we've seen it but but i think there's a lot more uh, that, that we might end up seeing so in that uh, context i think Ricky, you have to bring you into the next question and abhishek as well uh, which is really that look, you know, uh, uh, you know, as as sort of said in, the, in the, you know in, in his preliminary comments, a private M and A deal negotiated, including price, which is really important. Public M and A is a bit different, particularly regarded by most practitioners as being quite complex. So, could you, for the benefit of the audience and the panel, you know, shed uh, from your perspective what are some of the key challenges to, you'd like to go first and followed by Amshay? Uh, sure, Bharat, thank, thanks so much and uh, very happy to be here and 
share whatever insights we can based on all the experiences we've had. Uh, so yeah, I think you know there's always been um, uh, this aspect of the fact that public M and A is is very complex. You don't know what you're getting into, and it's important to understand why. So in a public M and A deal, you know there's it's like a web of several regulatory aspects that all sort of come together, and you know you've got to sort of make sense of all of it together at one point to really make a deal work. Um, you need to sort of think of the entire life cycle of the transaction process from start to end. Uh, and one might think that, isn't that something you would do in any transaction? Why is that so specific? Why do we all make such a big deal about public m and right? I mean, you'd think about that anyway. Uh, I think what is important to really understand that in a public m and consideration, uh, the regulatory aspects, uh, are very critical in determining very key factors of how you structure a deal. Whether it's the price itself, whether it's how you do your diligence, whether it's what kind of disclosures you can do or not do, all of that actually there is some sort of a regulatory framework that you have to work around. It's not just about a buyer and a seller and two people coming together and making commercial sense of a deal. You have to go by certain rules of the game. Uh, so I think that's why it's really important to Think through the whole, you know, get a sense, be advised in the right manner, and get a whole sense of the regulatory landscape up front. Because we've seen if you've not done that, somewhere down the line, you might have to go back to the drawing board, which is never, uh, you know, a situation anyone wants to be in. So, and what I'll do is I'll try and sum this up in a, you know, a, in, in, a, in a summarized manner so it helps. But effectively, what are the various things that are important here? The first thing is, what is the stake you're looking at? Um, uh, the second part is what are the kind of rights you're looking at? Now, why are these two questions really important is because whether you do or do not trigger an open offer uh, really depends on primarily these two aspects. Now, why is the open offer such a, you know, a big sort of elephant in the room typically is because again, whether you will or will not do a deal can completely change because of, you know, from a commercial standpoint, if you do land up triggering a public offer. so. It is very important to get some of these very basic fundamental aspects ironed out up front. There are certain exemptions available. It's good to go and see whether you know you actually fall within some of those exemptions or not. Um, the next thing that you would really look at is: Are you looking at doing the deal? Uh, is there a primary infusion? Is it only a secondary component? Uh, does the company need funds or not? Again, why is that relevant? Because if you want to do a primary infusion, there are certain guidelines you have to work under from a you know minimum pricing how much you can or you have to invest in terms of your primary infusion price uh, there have been certain amendments recently and it's good to uh, be abreast with all of that because uh, you know you may ha you have to look at the share price if you have to look at what the charter documents say so while you know commercially different parties can come together to try and make a deal happen there are all of these regulatory aspects of even how you price the deal, which becomes very important. And very often than not, you'd want to sort of track that right from the beginning so that the end goal sort of makes sense from where you started off. Um, I think the other point I would say is, if you come to the point that you will be triggering an open offer, it also becomes very relevant in terms of what is the kind of documentation leading up to the deal, which is why it makes everything so complex. Um, you know, by doing some sort of a term sheet, except do you land up triggering an offer or not? And again, why is that relevant is because uh, once you trigger an open offer, there's really no easy exit exit route. So to say you can't, you know, take an exit option out. Uh, there are very limited circumstances. I'm sure we'll come to that later in the discussion, but it's sort of a commitment to go through with the process. Um, you need to have a lot of financial arrangements, even regulatory, that's what you require to put up front there. Uh, so, you know, once you start the process, you really have to be committed with it. You need to know what are the various obligations that come along with it? What are the do's and don'ts behaviorally as well? Uh, it impacts the target company, it impacts, you know, who the investors are, it impacts a lot of people. Uh, so I think that I would say is broadly why the, you know, the public m and deals become so relevant. And of course, last but not the least, and Abhishek, if you want to chime in, is that because you're dealing with public markets, there is, of course, the whole part of the insider trading regulations. 
again, very, very important because how you do your diligence, what is the nature of information that you know, you're going to be privy to is very important and how you access that. I mean, with public market deals, you of course have a lot of publicly available information that you can go with. But if you go anything beyond that, there are again a whole bunch of do's and don'ts on price sensitive information, how you access it, and what is the timing of you know how you actually consummate the transaction. So I've tried to jump across a couple of different concepts, but I think this was just to give a flavor of why public markets M&A deals are, 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 are as complex as they actually are. Yeah, I, I think Rinki summed it up beautifully, but just a few points maybe to add in, in public M&A, some of the other challenges that we see are the time when you can actually close the transaction. In private M&A, you don't have concepts such as a blackout period. You don't have a contra trade restriction. You don't have a minimum public shareholding requirement that you need to adhere to at all points in time. What this does, for example, something as simple as a blackout period takes away six months almost from a year where you can't close a transaction. So going back to Inky's initial point, when you start the transaction to structure it, you also need to know when you are ending it, when you're planning to close it. If it falls in a blackout period, you can't do it. You'll have to change timings. You can't sell for six months after you bought it. And if you have to sell down, for example, like Rinky said, uh, if the tendering is high in an open offer, then you're probably going to sell at a lower cost than you've bought it. So all of these play into the legal and commercial reasons on why you need to structure up front and in advance. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, laying out that uh, contextual framework. And I think some of the points that you guys have mentioned, we will actually get into in a lot more detail. As an M&A practitioner and lawyer, I have to say, I find it very interesting how the approach to a transaction, and I really liked your point on commitment, right, right from the get-go changes, particularly also because of the nature of the regulator, right? In the private M&A world, you have the court, so you have arbitration. But in the public M&A world, you have SEBI sitting there, uh, you know, with a with uh, you know a stick which which at times is wielded, and and I think it's interesting to see how the behavior of market participants, advisors, and principals, targets, changes, boards, uh, when you have that uh, that 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 big cop out there, um, and and it's and it and that's interesting as compared to you know a judicial forum. But I think one of your comments also, Rinky, was you know uh, along uh, term sheets, and I picked that one up. And Pooja, I'm going to you know draw you into the conversation again, if I may in terms of you know the merits or or, or demerits and you know, how do you look at uh, potentially signing a term sheet in the context of a public deal given the background that you know has just been mentioned you know i think it's uh, important to you know uh, agree the key heads or uh, important heads of you know transaction upfront uh, through a term sheet or a mou uh, because that i think gives the direction of where the transaction is going to move uh, because these are all expensive you know you are investing time effort energy into a transaction and uh, you want to uh, also timing is time is of essence in these transactions because the price may run up you're disrupting in a way uh, the operations to an extent uh, of the companies uh, to focus on this m a and you would like to keep this period as as small as possible uh, there is always a running risk of leakage and therefore again price running up and other things happening regulators you know, uh, coming with the uh, uh, discussions on these kind of aspects, and therefore, term, what term sheet therefore it does in that respect is that you know brings a element of uh, clarity in terms of where the deal is heading, what the key aspects of the deal are going to be. It also makes the process a little bit time bound. I think uh, if you are in turn con considering to put a term sheet together for these deals and MOU deals, I think the one key aspect you have to consider before you put that in place is that you have to keep in a probably particularly in a public m and aspect, you have to keep it non-binding non uh, because obviously you do not want uh, the mm, want to trigger the tender offer obligations or any kind of disclosure uh, before you are fully cooked the deal. Um, that could in a way hurt the whole deal, so to speak. So I think that I think is the uh, the key consideration while you are agreeing to this uh, term sheet. And there are other things which are general part of these kind of term sheets in terms of break fees and uh, what the companies can and cannot do during this period so and obviously the commercials and other aspects ballparks are obviously agreed upfront so that you know you have clarity of the broad contours of that transaction and parties shake hand on that basis uh, so to speak and therefore not wasting each other's time yeah got it and and, and i think you know uh, 
if we, if we look at the term sheet, we have to look at it in a continuum in terms of uh, the deal moving forward. And in that context, Abhishek, you know, uh, you know, th there is the diligence aspect, and I and and you know, if, you know, maybe you could educate us in terms of you know where do you see the diligence fitting in and dovetailing it with with the term sheet, particularly since you have listed entities, you know, you can have both uh, financial sponsors as well as strategics actually interested in the target. So to the extent that you have a strategic actually investigating the listed target, uh, you know, do you, do you actually be facilitative and allow diligence and allow competitors effectively access to, uh, you know, information or do you build in safeguards? Because there's always a possibility that the deal may not go through and that that level of commitment isn't there that we alluded to earlier. Uh, could, you, could you share some thoughts? So, so Bhat, as we know, due diligence is a key pillar for m and For us to engage in any form of m and whether it's a strategic buyer, a competitor, a, a pure financial investor, they will always ask for uh, access to information for them to be satisfied that the company is in, in good health. Um, of course, when it comes to listed companies, there is an entirely separate regime which governs due diligence. This primarily comes from the perspective of protections under the insider trading regulations. And it requires that any listed company go to its board and the board should itself approve that unpublished price sensitive information can be shared with a potential investor. Now, this responsibility is a guided responsibility because what the regulations also require is that this information should be shared only if the board believes that sharing is in the best interest of the company. Now, let's look at it in two buckets. One is if it's a pure play financial investor who's looking to put money to the company, you will typically not have any concerns from a board's perspective. It is in the interest of the company that you get a financial investor as long as commercials are aligned. But when it comes to a competitor, there are further nuances that we need to consider. For instance, some of the information that is available with the company may be so sensitive that it, if it goes into the hands of a competitor, it's a strategic disadvantage. In that case, you could, of course, have situations where the board refuses to part with this information. But typically what we see is that is not the approach which is taken because to facilitate m &A, you need to have a due diligence. So a more practical approach that we've seen is for boards to share UPSI in a staggered manner. For instance, in an initial stage of the transaction, you, stare, you share information which is less sensitive and you can progress the transaction. And for certain very specific and sensitive data that you will only share once say, the transaction is finalized, you've signed the dotted line and or just prior to signing the dotted line is when you share the information to make sure that there is no harm that comes to the company. Now, needless to say, in all these scenarios, the information that is shared has to be protected by an airtight NDA because if all else falls apart and, and deals do fall apart, even after you sign them for regulatory reasons, other reasons, the data that has passed on needs to be protected in a way that the public shareholders and the company itself is fully protected. I just want to just chime in over here and uh, remove a little bit of the doom and gloom that we are kind of talking about a little bit here. In my mind, big picture, uh, over the last 20 years of having seen public m and I think the regime is far, far and significantly more facilitative today as compared to uh, 15 to 20 years back. Other than the fact that one has to keep an eye on the market price because that does impact your eventual tender of a price. In general, I think public m and and private m and have come very close to each other in terms of mechanism. Of course, there are safeguards to be taken and so on and so forth. And the regulator is also in incredibly proactive in trying to come out with facilitative regulations. We'll talk about some of that. I'll give you just one example. Ten years back, uh, the, we had a discussion with the regulator, whereby the regulator went to the extent of saying that if you're doing a diligence on a public company, after you're done with the diligence, please publish the diligence on the website of the company. Two, where we have come to the other extreme is to say that under an NDA, you can share non-public price sensitive information and keep it under wraps and so on and so forth. So I think uh, we, are, we are getting there as a country, as a regulatory framework as well. Yeah, in yeah, fact, no, I, just, I, yeah. So, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. I just 10 seconds. Uh, Saurav, in fact, fully agree. You know, if, if you go through the regulations now, in fact, what you said at the end, the regulations themselves have a line saying that they acknowledge the importance of 
sharing upsi for mini transaction today so yeah <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and I think the market participants have become much more sophisticated, uh, and, and as has the regulator. So, you know, there is a there is certainly an environment which is much, much more enabling and facilitative and an environment which also knows what's a, you know, what's a footfall versus, you know, what's, uh, you know, materially wrong uh, on a transaction. And I think, I think that's really facilitative because people know where they stand. You have the commitment, you have the process, uh, and you have the ecosystem which is enabling it. And as a result, you're seeing the deals. But 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 uh, sorry, I'm not going to let, let you go uh, easy. Uh, I've got to, I've got another question for you, uh, which is that look now that you're seeing some sort of a of, of a market trend, right? Uh, it could be a control deal, but you know, I, I guess my question is now related more to a uh, to a strategic minority interest, uh, not a control deal. But what's the sort of rights package, right? If there's a financial sponsor or there's a strategic and he's managed to negotiate, uh, you know. Uh, uh, an investment with a rights package what's typical and what's what are the nature of the rights that people can expect or should expect and how would you guide the audience in terms of the way they think about the rights package going into a listed company yeah uh, that's a that's a brilliant question actually Bharat. and frankly to my mind this is the one last pending aspect which requires material clarity from a regulatory framework and uh, let's first approach it from a regulatory perspective and we've gone through multiple uh, iterations on this topic there was a particular point in time for people who are familiar the, the should come matter at which point in time sebi contested and said that any right that you get which is over and above the minority shareholders in time is, uh, is is control and hence you will have to make an open offer under a certain framework and so on and so forth that matter went all the way up to the supreme court and unfortunately by the time it went to the supreme court the investor had already divested the shares of the company that he had bought and so hence that matter was never uh, decided as to what is really the bright line a few years later sebi came out with a consultative paper trying to define a bright line that okay fine if you're doing a minority investments these are the kind of rights that actually you can have and that don't trigger an open offer and after a set of discussions they decided to shelve that entire concept and so they've kind of left it open-ended and uh, what has happened as a result of that is that market participants are very wary and extremely conservative when it comes to seeking any kind of rights when you are a minority shareholder so what is par for the course is of course uh, board seat, uh, an observer at certain points in time, perhaps uh, certain limited information rights and perhaps uh, a preemptive right to maintain your shareholding. I think the philosophical concept which needs to come in is that there can and there should be certain type of protective rights which should not be in the nature of control. but it's a fine line again what is protective and what is uh, you know managerial control oriented so that borderline hasn't been tested very well and uh, as of now people are erring on the side of caution and most rights are fairly limited to the ones that i talked about you're you're, you're, you're quite right i think there is a, a crying out need for clarity uh, for the simple reason also that look unlike uh, most Western markets in India, some sectors are still regulated from a foreign direct investment standpoint. And you essentially have then three conflicting views because you have, you know, what is controlled from a foreign direct investment standpoint, what is controlled from a, you know, uh, uh, a competition law standpoint, and then what is controlled from a SEBI standpoint. And then, you know, if all of this uh, sort of uh, shakes out uh, while you've got a term sheet in front of you and you've got to get a deal done. So I think uh, I, I think I think some degree of clarity is is essential, particularly in, you know some of the sectors like you know retail and so on, uh, where where these issues become quite uh, intellectually exercising, if I could if I could put it that way. But uh, talking about you know uh, intellectually exercising comments, Sudhir, this is the time to bring you in, obviously. Uh, and and you know Sebi has actually uh, you know been noticing right uh, comments and. You've been involved in, I think, every capital markets committee from the last, you know, two decades, three decades, maybe longer. Uh, you know, you know, can you shed some light on 
you know, how some of your uh, uh, initiatives to get SEBI to think about um, consolidation, to think about some of their recent changes in terms of, you know, delisting and others, uh, and, 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 you know, SEBI's responsiveness on at least create, creating some clarity under the code on these uh, recent matters. So, sorry, Sudhir, I can't hear you. I don't know about the others on the panel. Yeah, we uh, sorry, my apologies. Uh, uh, so thank you, Bharat. And I will take you from what uh, Saurabh said earlier, that the regulator on the takeover side has been quite proactive and willing to listen to the issues that the practitioners has or the acquirers have. And over a period of time have made a number of changes uh, to facilitate the transaction and at the same point of time also uh, uh, put in changes to protect the investors uh, in a takeover transaction. So one of the two key uh, issues which have been highlighted by the acquirers over a period of time have been uh, around that the ability to take company private at a fixed price. That is one issue and second is the compliance with the minimum public shareholding requirement which was earlier also highlighted uh, on this uh, in this discussion and uh, now uh, a couple of years back sebi came up with the regime of open offer come delisting offer wherein you can make a delisting offer but sebi didn't change the reverse book building process it was still a reverse book building process uh, it has been a limited success only four transactions happened two were successfully delisted and other two the main issue which cropped up on those transactions was that the price which was discovered through the reverse book building process was much beyond the expectation of the acquirer and the acquirer rejected those transactions i think taking uh, a baby step to move away from the uh, reverse book building to delist now cb has provided that you can do a open offer come delisting offer by a new incoming uh, uh, person who will be in control of the company at a fixed price and that fixed price would be the minimum of the open offer price or the book value and it is left to the uh, incoming acquirer to decide at what premium uh, it is willing to pay over this minimum threshold and thereafter it will be a tendering at the at the fixed price the syndicative price given by the acquirer and if the 90 percent delisting threshold is met then the uh, company can be delisted and uh, but in case the 90 percent threshold is not met again the process has been simplified that the shareholders can simply decide to withdraw if they wish to withdraw from this offer and the open offer will be completed uh, one more addition that SEBI allowed to take care of the issue regarding compliance with MPS was that it is giving another opportunity to the acquirer that in the next 12 months, uh, you can attempt another delisting. At that point of time, if you reach and, and that is without compliance with the minimum public shareholding requirement, uh, only difference from the earlier scenario is that here the delisting will be through a reverse book building process. And in addition to meeting the 90% test, uh, you also have to meet the uh, acquire at least 50% of the public shareholding. So far, we have not seen any transaction in this space. But uh, as in our discussion, this is, an, uh, this is actively being pursued uh, by the various uh, uh, thought through by various acquirers while uh, structuring the trade. And another uh, change that SEBI has done again to take care of this compliance with minimum public shareholding requirement is around mean proportionate acceptance, whereby if post the open offer, the shareholding of the acquirer goes beyond 75%, then the acquirer can proportionately reduce the shares to be acquired under SPAs uh, stroke pref allotment and the shares to be acquired under open offer so that the post the open offer the shareholding of the acquirer remains below uh, uh, up to 75 percent only and there is no need to uh, bring down the shareholding thereafter so these are some of the recent initiative very positive uh, which have been taken by sebi in light of the uh, issues raised with with them and so what's what's your view is and the that two changes which 
yes. a positive positive impact and could, could you could you weigh in on some of these comments from a banker's perspective yeah yeah and and, and the two changes that sudeep talked about are both absolutely brilliant in my opinion uh, let's take the first one and it's a very simple thing i mean when you go out and you want to delist uh, in the earlier regime what did you tell the shareholder the the not so informed shareholder why don't you tender your shares it's a reverse book building you can put whatever price you want but i don't know whether i will accept it uh, you can try you can also sell in the market but you please tender here it will be good for me it was very confusing the moment you go and tell him that look here is a price you like the price please tender if you don't like the price you don't tender and it's no longer all or none you're allowed to go up to a certain threshold as a part of the open offer process it makes marketing that story that much simpler to the not so educated public shareholder so this is a brilliant concept in itself this is this kind of goes back to the regime when it what as it existed in the pre reverse book building which was introduced way back in 2002 the other is the scale back of the offer and we were unnecessarily penalizing acquirers you know if if a promoter was willing to sell 60% and you have to make an open offer for another 26% you are buying 86% you want to keep the company listed because public markets are beneficial for the company you have to sell 11% so you are buying from public shareholders and you are selling back to them and you are just giving them a lollipop on a platter so to say that's not a great idea instead now this brilliant change uh, this is a very very recent change no companies have yet done it you can scale back the offer so what does that mean instead of buying 60 from promoters you effectively you buy 53 or 54 and your uh, uh, 52 or 53 and your public share uh, open offer from 26% scales back to 18 19% so that your total remains at 75 which was the end goal that you were anyway reaching in the other scenario and it's a very nice uh, uh, way to do a transaction it's going to take away a major part of the so called complexity of doing public m&a so i i think these two changes are very very good and will be very helpful uh, for public m&a as we go forward yeah uh, i think we've talked about you know some of the procedural features of public m&a and some of the dispensations to Uh, the earlier requirements let's talk a little bit about some of the substantive issues that uh, come on uh, the table in terms of deal evaluation take over offer evaluation and particularly i guess that all of you have uh, guessed it now i'm talking about directors duties uh, so pooja i I'd, i'd like you to maybe comment on this and maybe sudhir uh, you know from the substantive element as well you know what do we make of directors duties in the context of a public takeover Or, or indeed, you know, in, in relation to your wide deal experience, any public transaction for that matter. No, I think the principle for directors duty is very fairly simple, right? I mean, directors are obviously nominee or you know are representative of the shareholders on the board, right? Uh, so what they their fiduciary duty is only towards you know the to ensure that they are whatever they are doing, they are doing in the best interest of the shareholders. I think what becomes also important uh, for directors to see is that you know. If, if these deals are complex deals involves legal technical and financial assessment and therefore i think uh, what as a, as a as a board uh, you know the directors normally do is you know they appoint the advisors right advisors to advise them on these aspects so that they can form right view for on behalf of the minority shareholder the other aspect of in the directors uh, and particularly the 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 companies who are getting taken over also becomes you know to see that you know how why these deals are happening the operations are not affected you know the company continue to grow and do their business in the ordinary course of business because these things can cause lot of you know disruption the at least the the uh, the public m&a tend to cause lot of you know noise in the market in the in the employees and stuff like that so i think that becomes a, cha- a key challenge to you know tackle for the directors and the management of the companies in an, in a, in a manner and then lastly i think the the uh, how you negotiate and discuss the the packages and exit links uh, exit link incentives you know in case of these amendments is another aspect that the management or the board have to decide and negotiate on behalf of the company i think those those are some of the things that obviously directors need to look into uh, besides the regular thing of you know seeing whether the value is right whether the deal makes sense for the company 
and then advising because I think a lot of these MA requires like through regulation requires the directors to give opinion uh, in some form and shape uh, about the transaction. Yeah, thank you, Pooja. And the way even from the takeover code, if you see, they have tried to takeover code has tried to create a balance between the interest of the acquirer and the shareholders and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, this open offer. So it provides that all the during this offer period, the business will be done in a normal course of business. So so as to protect the value for the investor, uh, the acquirer per se. But at the same point of time, it is also cognizant of the fact that corporate actions at per se cannot be stopped during this period. So though the this offer period is a small period of maybe two to three months, still it allows that certain corporate action which are otherwise restricted because they are not ordinary course of business. But if the company need to undertake those corporate actions, it can go to the shareholder, pass a special, special resolution and still continue to go ahead. So it there is a level playing field for the both sides the existing the company and vis-a-vis -vis the uh, incoming acquirer which is inbuilt into the regulations per se and the other aspect in typically which the directors need to be careful about is in relation to that if a deal requires any component work to be done by the company uh, it needs to amend it articles it need to do some other abc activities then they have to see that that is in the best interest of the company and the stakeholders including the shareholders and others and take appropriate decision in line with their fiduciary duties yeah i think uh, uh, thank you thank you uh, sudhir and puja i think i think you know the the substantive issue of directors duties um, is, is, a, is a very interesting one also particularly in the context of uh, you know how the cap table is built up in a highly diversified uh, you know cap table uh, some transactions uh, you know are perceived very differently as compared to a cap table where there's a concentration of shareholding and uh, you know we've had some very interesting uh, orders from SEBI on uh, you know recent NBFC takeovers uh, or attempted takeovers where uh, you know, essentially transactions which could have been classified as related parties were taking place, where the threshold is slightly different. And I think those kinds of transactions, uh, you know, put a lot of pressure on the board. Uh, and, and particularly, given the fact that the board is looking at a transaction uh, sort of prospectively, whereas the proxy advisory firms are looking at it, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, seeing where the share price is going and then can comment on it. Uh, so, so I think this is an interest, very, very interesting space. And uh, as, as I think Pooja mentioned, that look, and others have mentioned on the panel that there's a growing sophistication in the community in terms of getting these deals done and putting in place adequate deal protection mechanisms so that you know if your deal's printed on the cover page of the Eco Times or whatever, it is still defensible from every angle, whether it's a value angle, director's duty angle, stakeholder and governance angle. Uh, but uh, let me sort of you know bring 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 you into this in terms of uh, you know, the, you know, we, we, we've looked at process, we've looked at substantive issues, you know, so we looked at that, but you know, how, what are the modes of actually getting public deals done? Uh, could, you, could you walk us through the common features and the common uh, mechanisms and modes? Yeah, excellent, I'll do that. So big picture, there are, uh, uh, you know, the simplest one is obviously cash, you buy shares for cash and everything is uh, straightforward thereafter. What are the alternate modes of uh, doing a transaction? The second is uh, what we call a share swap, not through a merger, but a share swap. That is to say that, you know, if I as an acquirer have a listed currency, which is uh, valuable and the sellers are willing to accept it, then I can give shares, my shares in exchange for your shares so that you become a, a minority shareholder in my company. Uh, challenge with this methodology is that this transaction is a taxable transaction. So hence, it becomes only popular for sellers who either don't expect to pay substantive tax because of either the gains that they haven't made or you know, they are structured in a manner where they, it is tax friendly. So we haven't seen too many transactions of this type. The second one, which mimics the first, is a share swap through a scheme of arrangement or a merger as we commonly know it. Many examples of this, the, the Radiant Max merger, the Builders of KPIT merger, ING's merger into Kotak, 
PVR, Inox merger, GSK's merger into HUL, all of these are structured in this way. Very tax efficient, gives shares in exchange of uh, the seller shares, they get the buyer shares. The challenge is the timeline. It's a listed company, anywhere 12 months upwards is the timeline to implement that, a bunch of shareholder and regulatory approvals to implement that, but still seen as a methodology and a mechanism which is reasonably acceptable and many examples of that. And the one other aspect that I'd like to talk about is what is called a conditional open offer, again, not used very often, which is to say that, look, if your target shareholding is diversified, you don't have certainty of getting a minimum shareholding. When we did the S&P's acquisition of Crystal, it was a diversified shareholding. The largest shareholder was ICICI with 10%. Uh, and the buyers, S&P only wanted control of the company if there was a minimum of 51%. And the SEBI regulations permit that. We structured it in a manner whereby the transaction was for 75% of the company, conditional upon receiving 51, and the, you had the ability to give a differential price that look, if you got to just 51, you would pay a certain price. If you go beyond 60, you'd pay a sub slightly higher price, incentivizing people to tender. So uh, I think there are many enabling provisions which are there in the takeover regulation, some more frequently used, some less frequently used. So I think just to add to yeah. what Saurabh said that uh, one other uh, option that has also been done by uh, quite a few cases is a slum sale whereby and this slum sale could be either through a scheme of arrangement or a direct slum sale and this basically uh, the benefit the benefit of this kind of transaction is that you are cherry picking the assets that you want and you can and uh, hence and all some of the uh, difficulties which Rinki highlighted earlier of an open offer uh, regime are not something you have to deal with. So this is also, which has been done in quite a few cases. I think the only the flip side for uh, this is uh, that the cash gets trapped into the company and then the company has to look into how either to utilize the cash or to distribute the cash. And therein the director's duty that we just discussed earlier becomes very relevant. And many of these transactions would also be a majority of minority uh, approval transaction and hence it is important to give a sort of a uh, roadmap that how the company intends to utilize the cash which is available with us pursuant to this sale like uh, recently Majesco sold its US subsidiary and which was substantially all of its business and uh, at the time when the deal was announced they announced that how they intend to sit, uh, pay out the cash to the shareholders through dividend and through buyback. And they did that. And the it got overwhelming, transaction got overwhelming support from all the shareholders in its approval uh, while it was put to vote for approval. So that is another method which is being used uh, in few transactions nowadays. Yeah, and the crux of what Sudhir said for a slum sale, the giving certainty to shareholders, because you do need shareholder approval for such transactions certainty to shareholders of how that cash will be used or how it will be distributed is key and in one other instance we have seen is that you know a committee of independent directors was set up and what they said that we will receive this consideration keep it in escrow and ensure that it will be distributed to shareholders in a certain manner so these are all safeguards that have to be built in all in the effort to obtain the shareholder approval for such a transaction Got it. And uh, Rinki, if I could draw you into this, you know, we've talked about the modes of getting deals done, but you know, you could you could have the perfect term sheet, you would have great diligence, you could actually kick off your deal, and then something like COVID happens, and you're thinking, look, can I withdraw the deal? So, you know, uh, or, or or is there some other way to protect myself? So, just illustratively, and I'm not using you know COVID, you know, not specifically in relation to COVID, but just generally, are there circumstances in which, uh, although I'm in the public arena. Uh, uh, you know, can I can I actually withdraw once I've triggered a tender offer, or how how can I go about protecting uh, my my transaction? Yeah, no, thanks, uh, I think I think uh, this is possibly one of the again very fundamental differences when you're looking at a private M&A deal and a public M&A deal, right? So 
in a private M&A deal, we are used to having our deal documentation. You will negotiate your condition precedent, your termination rights, and a bunch of you know conditions that bilaterally between buyer and seller, you will agree that if X, Y, Z doesn't happen, then the deal doesn't happen. Now, in a public M&A deal, once you trigger an open offer, really a buyer and seller might agree whatever they have to, but even if the primary deal does not take place or does not go through, there are really very limited conditions and situations under which you can withdraw from a tender offer. Uh, you know, that sort of takes me back to where we started from is when you trigger an offer, you need to sort of think through the entire transaction that you're not going to be able to easily withdraw out of your open offer obligation. So you trigger the transaction, you need to think through that. This is pretty much going to go through, you know, the entire gamut because you don't want basically your primary transaction sort of, you know, you withdraw from that and you're stuck with whatever comes in the open offer. So it sort of goes hand in hand together. So you think of it as a composite way. And, and the reason it's really important is that the conditions under which you can even withdraw the open offer, this is also statutorily legislated in the takeover code. Uh, SEBI does not prefer a situation where open offers are generally withdrawn. There are limited circumstances. Of course, if there are regulatory approvals that are required for the open offer to go through, yes, that is one of the um, one of the reasons where you know you can actually go and withdraw an offer. Uh, but however, if there are other bilateral conditions, anything out of the regulatory relevant to the open offer, in those scenarios, SEBI is you know really not keen on open offers being withdrawn. Uh, this is also consistent vis-a-vis -vis certain of judicial precedents as well, vis -a -vis under the old takeover code and the new one as well. Uh, where really what SEBI is looking for is that, are there reasons really outside the control of the bidder because of which the open offer cannot be completed? So they're really looking at very, the threshold is very, very high. So, you know, uh, there have been scenarios where, you know, folks have gone and said, you know, our primary deal is not happening. Those conditions have not been satisfied. Let us withdraw. And SEBI has basically rejected those kind of withdrawals. Uh, there are really limited circumstances, I think, where withdrawals have been permitted, primarily where even for acquiring just the open offer component, uh, you require certain regulatory approvals, whether it's a sectoral regulator or otherwise. In those scenarios, uh, you know, SEBI has come out and said, that's fine. You can withdraw the open offer there as well. But really, it's a it's it's a very important factor to think through when you embark on the process, uh, because they, you know because of this reason that you might nobody wants to be stuck with a small stub of shares in a company where your larger transaction has failed. So yeah, I think that's very very critical. So exactly exactly right, and I think I think it's curious because you know when I apply my mind to this. I think you know if, if the theoretical possibilities, right? I mean, you discover fraud, uh, you know, shouldn't happen in a listed company, but you know, theoretically it's possible, right? But even in those situations, you know, you can't withdraw. I think it's and, and the other intellectual extreme, you know, just just so that you know we can we can look at extremities and compare and contrast. You know, say I'm not triggering a tender offer, I'm taking five percent in a listed company, uh, primary infusion. Uh, I, I can actually try and bake in some circumstances in which I'll say that, look, at least contractually, I have agreed between investor and issuer that, look, I'm not going to go ahead and do the, you know, the, 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 the transaction. So uh, I think I think it's interesting that there are these contrasts that exist in terms of the approach and how it shakes out. Uh, but but I, I suppose the regulator is saying that, look, if you are triggering an offer, it is such a substantial transaction that has so much of public interest that the public interest overweighs the private interest. and uh, you know you have to you have to go ahead um so so uh, I, you know I, we we've spoken a lot about uh, you know some of the substantive and procedural issues but ultimately it's all about the number and the number can change it drastically you could agree a number with a listed target uh, but by the time you end up completing the deal and cutting the check the, the target could be somewhere else so what are the principles of uh, valuations of listed companies should be constructed and uh, sort of as the deal maker uh, uh, you know, from a, from an advisory perspective as well. I, th I think I'd request you to lead us in this, and so maybe you could weigh in with your transaction experience. Yeah, maybe on this one, I'll just uh, talk about the banker's perspective or uh, public market valuations at this particular point in time, and maybe I'll turn to Sudeep for some of the regulatory matters. Um, uh, you know, so from a distance, if you were looking at public markets in general, and if you saw the so-called meteoric stratospheric rise over the last uh, 18 to 24 months in terms of 
prices and valuations, etc., you would tend to start to think that you know our valuation stretched at this particular point in time. I will tell you in simple one line, all the froth is gone, all of it. And I track a very simplistic metric for this. Uh, we look at the BSC Sensex, uh, 30 stocks. Okay, it's, it's representative. It's not necessarily representative of every single company, but it's a reasonably representative. Uh, the last five year, one year forward PE multiple, the average for the last five years is 19.4. Okay, so the five year average is 19.4. Last year, the multiple went up almost up to 23. 24. It is currently trading at 18.6. That means that current valuations are below the five-year average. All the froth is gone. <laughs> it's a good time to come in and look at public MA. Of course, there's going to be a premium to the public market price when you do a transaction, but uh, that's the perspective on uh, broader on uh, valuation. Maybe I'll turn to Sudhir to talk about some of the uh, regulatory frameworks uh, around this. So over and above what um, uh, Saurabh talked about is that SEBI also, the takeover regulation, provide a minimum pricing formula where the offer has to be made at a price higher than that particular pricing formula, which is primarily look back into the previous acquisitions made by the acquirer in last uh, one year and also the, the trading price on the exchange in the 60 uh, BVAC of last 60 trading days prior to the public announcement for the transaction. So that becomes your flow price as far as the open offer is concerned. And even if there have been situations like a recent situation of Memphis is where the open offer price was higher than the, the SPA price because the last 60 day trading price has gone up. And that's where it is very important that in because of this particular uh, look back pricing formula, it is very important to keep the deal totally under uh, radar so that it is not the price doesn't leak out because the once the, it is published in the money control or in economic times, then the price start moving up thereafter. And we have seen situations where the deal becomes unviable because the price has moved up uh, to a uh, level where the acquirer is saying that why I should why I should be paying it doesn't make any sense for me to pay this price and the, I think the additional uh, point is that the the basic principle that SEBI has applied is that there is should be a quality of treatment among the large shareholder who is selling and the minority shareholders and hence SEBI has provided that any uh, payment made to the shareholders for the purpose of acquisition of shares. Uh, or control whether it is pursuant to a share purchase agreement or pursuant to some other agreement should also be added to the uh, this uh, SEBI formula price for the purpose of calculating the open offer. Uh, however, this regulation is to be read very carefully to see what are the transactions which will fall into it and what are the kind of transactions which will not fall into it and it is uh, it requires a bit of application of mind and there are situations where there could be a separate transaction for acquisition of uh, asset or something from the promoter which may not be added to the uh, to the value which is to be paid to the shareholder but these are very case specific situations and uh, a deep thought need to be given uh, to see that the payment being made to the share uh, to the seller is uh, for something different and not for the acquisition of shares. Absolutely, and and, and I think it's uh, you know given the depth of the markets and the potential for public M&A in India, some of these nuances need to be ironed out. I mean, you know, you take a company which is a small company, you know, could be listed historically, uh, taken over by a large strategic company. The uh, existing promoter is told, look. Uh, continue for two years and here's a bump up in your executive compensation if you do a good job you can stay on and suddenly the economics of the transaction change for for a very different reason so uh, i think i think some amount of you know regulatory consideration as we go into issues are of of, of more nuance is 
is necessary you know for the for the sake of the markets so that uh, you know deals can get done and people can you know do the you know do the right thing and the proper thing uh, I, I i think I, I you know i'd like to take a maybe maybe have a a common question for the panel uh, if i may and uh, maybe sort of you could uh, you know uh, kick us off and then um, uh, and then hand over to another panelist except me uh, because uh, uh, you know, I, I have the privilege of moderating, but I don't have the knowledge to actually, uh, you know, contribute for the audience significantly. But uh, may, may I just ask, what are the critical trends that you're seeing? And if you could highlight maybe one or two, and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll pass it on to the rest of the participating panelists. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pick that up. So I think the, I would say the single most important big picture trend that we are seeing is uh more and more of stock for stock transactions whether it be within related parties or whether it's a transaction between unrelated parties we talked about some of them i mean ing's merger into quota gsk's merger into hul related partly related party transactions of uh, hdfc hdfc bank merging i mean i inox and pbr merging uh these are uh, I think stock for stock transactions have come of age. This is a globally and internationally accepted trend. More transactions happen in this form than for cash. And I think the Indian markets are coming of age in many ways. And this is one key trend. Maybe I'll pass on to Pooja uh, to add on uh, the perspective to this. No, I think um, I think that is true. I think the the the, uh, the that is happening in the. Uh, also price wise we are seeing that you know as you mentioned the the uh, the bottoms you know you, the the levels have come down since the 2021 run in the markets right i mean therefore i think what we are now seeing is that you know more interest in uh, getting into the the mna book uh, for these assets uh, is is also happening now you know because uh, you are seeing that uh, some corrections have happened in the market the assets have become cheap liquidity still remains for good assets available in the market and that's the that's the trend which is consistently available i think uh, people also want to you know tie up the liquidity for these transactions before the fed fed hikes that we are listening and we are we know is coming through so that i think is another trend we are seeing that you know people want to do and close a deal and fund uh, arrange the funds before the the next round of uh, liquidity crunch and the price hikes happens would you would you like to nominate another panelist and then maybe we can take one question uh, from the audience questions i think there are a couple of questions on Abhishek, the, on the i think is nodding and want to say something it seems <laughs> sure we are happy to i think another trend that we've seen is financial sponsors uh coming in to acquire control of listed companies uh this has been something which has been quite prevalent uh in the sense where a, a financial sponsor comes in buys control instills a professionally managed uh, top management to run the company and at the same time, they work on their exit in the near future. Uh, typically, we would see that these would only be strategic investments and very long term. But it's good to also see that financial sponsors are looking this as a as a very viable uh, method to invest their funds and uh, and acquire companies. Another trend uh, that we are seeing is uh, yeah. around the early closure of the transaction. Uh, only the takeover code provides that the transaction can be closed only post closure of the offer or after a period of uh, waiting period and depositing 100% funds into the escrow. Now uh, there is another window uh, which is available if the shares are transacted on a stock exchange, then the shares can be kept in an escrow without even funding the 100% uh, escrow and now we are seeing more and more sellers insisting that as soon as it is technically possible to close the deal uh, close the deal and then you keep on doing your open offer uh, as per the timeline prescribed by SEBI. thank you thank you Sudhi. Uh, there's a there's an audience question from ananya and uh, maybe Rinki, i could uh, request you to have a quick uh, thought about it you know to what extent would you uh, and provide your comments to what extent would one expect uh, binding term sheets in a public m a deal and uh, to the extent that they are binding are they are they really enforceable <laughs> so it's got a it's got two limbs to it but uh, maybe we take the first bit which is that you know would you expect to find a fully binding term sheet in a 
in a public M&A deal. I'm assuming it's a deal that triggers a tender offer as well. Yeah, see, I think this goes back to, you know, the initial part of do you land up triggering an open offer and what the triggers are, right? The triggers really from an open offer perspective under the takeover code is whether you have made an, there's actually been an agreement to acquire. And that is the primary sort of trigger point of the entire process. Once you trigger that, whether you've signed your long form SPAs, SSAs or not, but that is really the sort of uh, starting point of the whole process where there's no coming back from. So when you say you want to sign a binding term sheet, I think it's very important. Uh, typically, I think it's, it's, it's not something that is done specifically because of the sensitivity. And uh, as I said, any term sheet, any MOUs, any NDAs, whatever you sign, the language of that document at the initiation of a transaction becomes very important. Uh, because at that point in time, you're not really ready in that sense to trigger the entire process. So you have to be really careful with whatever you sign, you know, before you want to actually trigger off with your long form definitive documentation. So yeah, I think the short answer is typically you won't have a binding term sheet in that sense, specifically on the fundamentals of the deal, right? Regarding your price, regarding the way the deal will be structured, all of those aspects, uh, because you don't want to have a premature trigger of the open offer. So you have to be really careful about that. Exactly. Ricky makes an important point. And, uh, you know, in 2011, the takeover code was changed. Before the 2011, the language was a uh, binding decision by the acquirer. So in that regime, even providing a binding offer triggered a term sheet, it triggered an uh, open offer. That has been changed to a agreement. Agreement means two sides. So it still means that, yes, Potentially in the current environment, you can provide a binding offer, but that offer, if accepted, triggers uh, of the main transaction. The question of whether or not that binding offer can be legally enforced is another is, is a topic for another day. <laughs> no, agreed. And since I don't have any of my litigation partners, uh, it'll be remiss of me to talk about enforceability without them. But, uh, but I, I think keeping one eye on the okay. clock. So I'm just go, saying go, that go again, yeah. one of the trend, right? We are seeing in terms of regulatory change that we are seeing most of these changes that we spoke about in the last one hour, right? I mean, they're all inching us towards the international practice, more and more inching us towards what we are seeing in the international market. I think that's how the regulator are testing it, and I think it's it's, it's the right thing to do, also, right? I mean, what has worked so well in international market uh, is 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 something it's it's tried and tested, and it's it's uh, makes sense to you know bring them these practices into India. Uh, Correct. So just keeping one eye on the clock, uh, Abhishek, would you like to maybe give us, uh, you know, three key takeaways uh, that the audience should keep in mind from this uh, webinar? Thank you, Bharat. I think this has been quite a thought-provoking session, especially from a, a business, commercial, uh, legal perspective. It's It's been a good mix. The three key takeaways that I had from this, first was on the due diligence. There is a very structured process that's in place for listed company due diligences. Um, it has to go to the board of the listed company. Again, something which is very commonly done, uh, very structured and straightforward, but that process must mandatorily be followed for any investor to, Im to engage in uh, public M&A. Uh, there are various structures that exist within this where you can share UPSI either in a tranched manner or in a single shot. Again, depending on the commercials and the deal requirements. Uh, the second takeaway is on the rights package. Uh, as we had discussed, there is no golden rule on the rights package. What's really important is that each package is seen on a case-to-case -case basis, and it is assessed as to whether these rights cumulatively are protective or participative in nature. For a minority investor, it's important that these rights are only protective, because any rights which infringe onto participative would effectively trigger an open offer. Now, these could be uh, as we have discussed, things like having a single board seat or say having veto over a capital issuance or something of that nature. But the moment you extend these to say uh, approving the business plan or uh, appointment of KMP, in those cases, you might infringe upon uh, protective rights. Uh, the third takeaway is on the uh, recent changes to the takeover regime. Uh, as we discussed, there have been significant changes which make deal making a lot easier. 
you have the ability now to launch a combined open offer from the listing and at the same time you can also have a proportionate sell down uh, structure where you are freed effectively from the obligation of a sell down at the end of the deal uh, if you get a higher tendering this gives a much larger deal certainty and it's of course very useful uh, in structuring the transaction super uh, thank you abhishek and i think uh, your thoughts were very helpful and insightful in terms of summarizing i think the key takeaways and uh, from from these uh, very rich discussions uh, before closing one request to the audience we have a poll slide uh, which in a few seconds will be on your screen we really value your feedback and i would be very grateful if the audience could um, <clears throat> provide us some feedback by participating in the poll We'll keep this slide on for another maybe 30 seconds. Okay, and we're back. Uh, so I think uh, I just want to thank uh, uh, my 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 very esteemed panelists, uh, Saurav, Rinki, Puja. You know, thank you so much for your time. Without you, this would not have been possible. Very very rich discussions. Uh, based on you know you know your rich experience, but also you know your candor uh, to share some of these thoughts with us. We're you know done an outstanding job. I don't have to say it, uh, and and we are indeed very very much uh, indebted to you. Uh, to the audience, uh, you know I would say I hope you found the webinar interesting. I hope this helps you as you think and plan your public M&A transactions, knowing the sort of commitment uh, that is involved and the fact that look the point of no return could be closer than you think. Uh, I, I would also add that you know after the webinar you will uh, receive uh, a copy of today's presentation material, some summary notes, and a link to the recording. Uh, uh, please uh, also uh, you know feel free to share your more detailed feedback. Uh, you know we will be sending you a form. The form takes less than a minute. I promise to complete. Uh, many thanks also to uh, Sudhir and to Abhishek. Uh, you know, Sudhir, for your uh, decades of experience that you've, uh, you know, that you've uh, crystallized for all of us, and, and, and Abhishek for your very articulate comments. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, you've been a great audience today. Hope this is helpful. You know, stay safe, stay well. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam.